Thank you, Alistair. So, um, hi everybody, welcome to Fossil G one more time. I am uh, Ivan Sanchez. For those who don't know me, I am a nerd. I dropped out from computer science, which means I don't have any formal education in topography, photogrammetry, uh, geodesy, or anything of the like. Uh, I did buy a GPS back in 2006, and since I did that, it has been a downward spiral to all the things that we love and hate. So before I get into the meat of this, I want to say a few things. I don't like Zoom. It has had a few complaints uh, over the last few weeks regarding security and data privacy, and it's not flossy. And because we are part of OSGEO and the OS in OSGEO is transversal open source, I do think that it is our moral duty to take a stand for open source. So, you know, try Jitsi, it's fine and it works. I know, I know that there are practical concerns here and I know that the organizers have not letting perfect be the enemy of good. It's still, I shouldn't be prevented from saying, hey, open source rules, right? Also, since we are in the UK now, I am going to speak chiefly English. So in every uh, point that I could, I am writing color as it should. Also, since we are going to talk about multispectral, I want to remember that uh, usually we only care about the visible color bands of the spectrum, uh, which is the red, green, and blue, and then we build up everything from there. But uh, multispectral is about to say, uh, worrying about the whole spectrum the whole spectrum. If you don't get this joke, it's because you're not British. I mean, a British joke, we can all go home now, all the way to world home. Fine, so this is not really about uh, WebGL, this is about video game tech for a while, which is going to be OpenGL and WebGL. It's really a bit the uh, same until, uh, unless you get to the specifics. So something that I like from both GIS and uh, video games is that they are multidisciplinary. You can get into a very specific field within GIS or within video games and stay there for 20 years of your professional life. There's a lot to unpack. I just love that fact. You can go nerd into one very specific field and just nerd out for years. Both fields have acronyms that don't make any sense whatsoever. And I guess that a lot of people here will know uh, what EPSG stands for off the top of your heads, right? I should give a prize to the first one in chat who says that. But if you're not, uh, if you're new to, uh, to GIS, you might not be aware that EPSG stands for European Petroleum Survey Group, which makes no sense because an EPSG code should be called a datum projection code. That name makes much more sense. Uh, on the other hand, in video game tech and OpenGL, we have something called VBO, which stands for Vertex Buffer Object. The problem with that is a Vertex Buffer Object does not hold vertices, it holds attributes for vertices. It's not a buffer because it's not a temporary data structure, it's a semi-permanent data structure. And it's not an object because it's not object-oriented. So it really should be called something like Attribute Write-Only Memory Allocation. That would make much more sense. So both fields have weird, weird coordinates. When you go into GIS first, it's like, yeah, everything is left long, and then you start reading about all these crazy, really, really scary words that I'm afraid of. If you go into video games, you learn that there's like five or six different coordinate systems, depending on when, uh, what you're looking at. Uh, most of them are kind of understandable, especially the world coordinates are kind of, it, are easy to understand. It's you plant all your game map and everything has a coordinate relative to the game map. The screen coordinates are also easy to understand. There's a problem where the screen coordinates start from one corner of the screen and then the, all the mathematical coordinates start at the bottom of the screen because one is Cartesian and that's uh, relative to where the electronics start indexing things. So it's really weird. Then depending on technology, the textures can be rough or not rough so the Coordinates can be negative and still the stuff will work. It's messy. The uh, most difficult to understand are the clip space coordinates. To think about, to, uh, uh, to get an idea of how this works, you have to think that the line from your eye forward, that's the set uh, axis. So everything up will be the X, everything to the left or right is Y, and everything deep is set. 
So whenever you're doing video games, it's doing a coordinate projection from the world coordinates to these clip space coordinates. Then it flattens everything onto your screen, making another coordinate projection to scale things up and down. Both fields have more than RGB to their pixels. Um, in GIS, it's useful to work with infrared and extrude reflectivity and panchromatic stuff and three or four different kinds of elevation, which is always fun, as a lot of people will know. In video games, do you also have more stuff than RGB? Do you have specifically important or the bump maps, which are normal maps? Uh, and then do you have how much amount of light reflects on a surface, which is the specular map? And then if something is moving, you can get a motion map to make something more or less blurry. And you can get something like in the, in the order of 20 different parameters for one pixel. In both cases, and this is quite an important thing to realize, the RGB color that you're looking at in your screen is a function of the data for each pixel. Usually, if we have a true color image, we just project, we just map that one to one uh, to the screen color. In media games, it's usually the uh, texture color times the light, times the reflectivity, but the light has to be um, cross multiplied uh, with the vector multiplication with the source light direction times the color of the light. But the direction of the light is modified with a simple sum by the bump map. So something that is rough will reflect the light from different sources and it creates a weird effect. And this is, if you are going to take one thing away from this talk, it has to be this. Video games are doing raster algebra. So something like this that I'm going to put into the chat right now, this is doing raster algebra. This is just the texture with a light source. And if you can read this code, which I can, it's getting some positions of, uh, it's getting the position of the current pixel here, and then it's extrapolating the position of a different pixel in the direction towards the light or away from the light. I'm not sure about this point. Then it's fetching the color of the current pixel and the pixel near the light, comparing their luminosity, and then it's brightening up or brightening down the pixel in relation to the luminosity of a pixel nearest, nearer or farther to the light. This is raster algebra. And this is happening, you know, 20 times per second in my machine, which is basic. This is the one thing I want you all to remember. This is doing the restaurant. So the big difference between GIS and games is that GIS is geared towards accuracy and games must be fast. Uh, this is an actual quote from uh, people who are worth talking about OpenStream uh, something like 10 or 15 years ago. OpenStream has an accuracy limit of half a centimeter, more or less. And people with cadastral applications, they were just burning that, saying that if this cannot hold values less than one half a centimeter worldwide, this is completely useless. That hasn't been the case for OpenStream, of course. But games are a completely different thing. They have to work fast. If something doesn't work fast at full resolution, you're going to get a crazy gamer with very expensive equipment complaining in YouTube that, oh my God, this video game doesn't run at full resolution with 4K shadows and multi volumetric things all around. So this has been historically a very different uh, set of things to care about. However, we are, uh, I think we are converging a bit about that. GIS has been faster because of tiles, a lot. Since 2005-ish, tiles have been speeding things up immensely because you only worry about the amount of data that you need to worry about. Uh, before that time, in the early 2000s, the GIS field was all about having all the data at all the time in full resolution. When you realize that you only have to show partial data to cover your screen, things became much easier. And when you realize that you can cache things on web servers, then tiles were the way forward. We have had that for a long time with WMTS. Vector tiles have taken over vector data for the last uh, five years or so. 
and then cloud optimized geotiffs they are really a tile pyramid in one file that you can query by range so it's the same thing you just care about tiles and transfer small amounts of data uh, up and down to cover your needs no more now gpus have been getting more and more uh, fast and also more accurate over the years because whatever reason you want to say the point being all gpus back in the late 90s and early 2000s, they could only worry about a few triangles and 8-bit textures. But internally, they moved on uh, forward to 24-bit floating point numbers for all the values internally in the shader. And then a uh, few years later, you can, all, you can just push 32-bit float pointing numbers in data cubes, like actual data cubes with three, uh, three dimensions to create the data. Unfortunately for us, this tech is everywhere. We can get 98% of uh, support in web browsers for WebGL and something about 75 for WebGL2, which is not too much until Apple gets into the one wagon, but it's high enough to consider it uh, wide support. Now the sweet spot for this, and this is the thing I am convinced it can be done and should be done, is that you can get a raster tile with either 8-bit color, like visible red, green, and blue, or 16-bit per pixel, or 32-bit per pixel, per sample, because let's, remem let's remember, we have several bands on every image. We can put that into a WebGL texture or an OpenGL texture directly with no transformation whatsoever. We can just dump data into video memory and let the GPU convert all those textures with a lot of data into a visible RGBA color. And you can do real-time raster algebra because remember, and I'm going to say this, this once again, and you can fight all the, uh, all, the, all the time you want with me about this fact. Video games have been doing raster algebra better and a hundred times faster than any GIS software for years. That's true. Let's complain about the, this in the coffee room. This is not without challenges because GIS has a lot of history. We like to have our own tools in the, in the CPU. The uh, state of the art, as far as I'm aware, and please correct me about this later, is that every different tool that does raster algebra uses its own specific language. I haven't seen what we computer scientists call a formal um, damn, I forgot about the name. Um, a formal grammar for the, uh, for the raster algebra languages. Uh, all the tools have a fairly simple and or fairly easy to understand language with just the raster name, the band names and mathematical operators. But I haven't seen a, or, or I haven't noticed a formal specification of those languages. So as far as I'm where these are different languages which are not going to be compatible sooner or later i don't think you can just copy paste one of these languages to any other tool we have seen the emerges of raster as a service um, this has the downside i think of being a um, kind of an evil incentive because what you want if you have a, if you are operating a raster as a service service what you want is more traffic so you can invoice more money so you don't really have an incentive for generating less traffic whereas users do have an incentive for receiving less traffic because it will make things faster so it's a bit perverse i don't really know how to handle that but i think it's there and also we have metadata um, Emily was talking about this uh, briefly in her talk uh, in the previous session. And the thing is that the things like the photogrammetric interpretation, it's in the geotiffs, but it's hard to read uh, because it's not something that fits into the whole GPU uh, video game uh, graphics processing pipeline. Uh, something like the photogrammetric interpretation is kind of what raster algebra are you going to do to this data, which is stuff that I'm interested in. So I don't want to choose from five different options. 
I want to define my own option on how to convert this data to RGB. Uh, there are a lot of other metadata, such as the luminance values or the aperture of the sensors, which are included in GOT files from Sentinel and so on. And there is no straightforward way of translating that into something that, uh, that we can use for shading it. On the other hand, we have a lot of tech, which is deeply entrenched. We have uh, concepts such as models and scene trees and materials in, in GL. So everything that is, that is about GL, you assume that it's a 3D world. I don't care about 3D world. There is no way to debug this. It's horrible to, to work with this. There is magic. If you're a CompC and have been working with the C, this has the low level pointer problems, which you cannot debug, which makes it double horrible. And looking at the specs, it just no. I uh, one of the one of my horror, most uh, one of my worst nightmares was reading the two hundred WMS specification years ago. I don't want to read more three hundred specs in PDF that are slightly inconsistent with themselves. So I'm going to uh, share with you the secret of hacking web maps. Do you do analysis? Do you do morphosis? Do you do synthesis? If you want to do anything in computer science and programming, you have to do this. Since these are fancy Greek words, I'm going to translate to English, which is you break it up, you change a part, and you put it back together. Or you are aware of all the moving parts in your system, you change one very specific moving part, and you make sure that everything stays together. This is how uh, web mapping library works, usually. You pan the map, get a tile, calculate the URL, fetch it from the network. When it's ready, you just put it in the DOM or render it somehow. What I want to do here is put something in the middle in a surgical way. You do the request for the tile, you get the tile data, you put that tile data into the GPU, you run the thing, and when you have the RGBA result, you put that back into the map as if it were a tile, because the format of the RGBA result of the raster algebra is completely compatible with the tile. Also, if you go into the uh, graphics processing pipeline, usually you are uh, talking about a 3D model with uh, triangles and uh, the camera perspective transformations and so on, and I don't care about that. What I, what I want is just have one square, do all the raster algebra and the pixels, get the RGB tile. So what's available right now? They are proofs of concept. You can, uh, you can search for this project, Tile Layer GL, and there's a branch on the Open Layers project that I was working in. WebGL 1, which is more ubiquitous, it has some uh, restrictions on how much data you can load safely, which can impact some applications. Uh, WebGL 2 does not have that application, and you can actually have an actual data cube of at least 2,000 pixels each side with 32-bit floating point data natively with little um, precision loss, which is absolutely fantastic. You can just plug GeoTIFJS to read GeoTIF data and dump the data, and it just works. Uh, byte packing to support 16-byte uh, data in, uh, in WebGL1 is possible. It's messy, though. So there are a few issues that I was hitting yesterday when I was preparing the demos. Uh, the bounding boxes of GeoTIFs they are relative to the bounding box of the geotiff itself. So if you have a geotiff, you just slice that in four and each of those in four and so on and so on. You don't care about the global tile um, grids or any kind of geodetic grids, so they don't really match. When I'm requesting a tile from geotiff.js, it's doing resample, resampling, and that is doing in the CPU right now, and it's becoming a problem because it takes too much memory, it runs in CPU uh, hot, it's not perfect. Uh, one good thing, okay, we can not assume that the tiles are the same. So if we, go, if we go back to this thing, we don't do the URLs for tiles, we query the, the geotiff, and then we extract the actual geotiff tile, not the globally referenced tile, and we work from there. One it's minute. possible, and you have to redo all the logic, and it's awful. You can also just skip all that, go WebGL inside GeoTIFF, and do all the resampling in GPU. That, is, that means that you should uh, have shaders in the uh, GeoTIFF logic and for, for resampling and for photogrammatic interpretations. 
And it's time for demos. And I have less than one minute for demos, but uh, during the question, uh, period for questions, I'm going to ask people to tell me how to interpret images. So let's just hope this goes well. So first thing I want to do here is I want to pull this one here. This is an indexed GeoTIFF from uh, Vincent that uh, prompted me to do this a few months ago. This is loading a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, which is three gigabytes in size. It's reading the uh, indexed value of that GeoTIFF and it's applying one color depending on the category. And the cool thing is I just can change the way I'm uh, visualizing this, this data in real time or near real time. And I think this is just so cool. There is a bit of a lag, which is not really noticeable in the video, I guess. Uh, that's because of the way that OpenAirs is post-processing for the projected tiles. It's, the pipeline is not too trivial, but it works. And I'm really happy that it works. I'm hoping to put this online in uh, shortly. The uh, second thing is this demo for uh, fully multispectral support in uh, Leaflet GL2. What I'm doing here is I'm loading four different cloud optimized geotiles and I'm fetching data from all of them and storing them in 15 different uh, variables here. And I can just do raster algebra here and output a color. So if I want to, uh, to show true color, what I would do instead is uh, for the red, I want the true color red for the green, I want the true color green. And for the blue, I want the true color blue. And that will show me true color. If I want to replace, let's say, the uh, if I want to do um, false color, I will just put uh, near infrared, which is the band eight, I think. Since the band eight is, this is the raw data from the GeoTIFF, the values from true color are from zero to one but the values from all the other bands are the raw values from zero to 32,000 because it's a 15 significant bead value. So I can just uh, divide this number and hey, I have false color of all of a sudden. So the demos are kind of working and uh, I think it's going to be time for questions. Or oh. please, if, if you don't have any question, Tell me uh, a way to interpret 12 bands of, of Sentinel data at the same time. What kind of stuff can I do with this that makes sense and doesn't look horribly ugly? <laughs> You'll be glad to know that we do. We have a, a few questions. Um, so first question here is from Tom Chadwin and it says, in layperson's terms, what else other than handling much larger data does WebGL2 offer over WebGL? Um, it offers a lot of things that we don't care about. That would be the answer. I don't care about transformation buffers. I don't care about being able to query textures in the vertex shader. I don't care about that. So we can go back to here. And in WebGL2, you have a lot of stuff all over the graphics pipeline that are not really useful for raster algebra. So we have a, a question from Brett Carlock, and I'll try and get this right. So the, the context is a slide that you were showing about the flow of tiling into a GPU and then out to web maps. Yes. Um, and the question was, uh, so are the last two steps on that uh, slide analogous? Um, so what would those last two steps be analogous to for gaming engines? you don't have those steps in gaming engines. Okay. That's the thing. Okay. That, that's the thing. You have to be aware of all the moving pieces and mix and match the pieces you want. Because in, game, in gaming, we are used to having one output frame buffer. Okay. Just, your screen is the final result. That's it. That's what we're used to. Uh, when I'm doing this for web maps, the output frame buffer is not the final step. I want to pipe that data down, down somewhere else. There is something that you can, uh, you can think about, which is um, rendering frame buffers in frame buffers. Or, and for this, you have to look at uh, the oldest example of this is the uh, monitors in Duke Nukem 3D. 
that I don't. Uh, some video games allow you to have like the video screens inside the video game itself. So what's that doing is uh, doing uh, rendering a scene and then using that scene as a texture in the video game itself. That's something that can be done. Uh, I'm trying to find a quick example of that. I'm not. I'm not doing that. But my point is, you have to uh, when you're dealing with this, uh, and, and when you're dealing with 3D frameworks. I think it's a bad idea to think that the framework is all you can do. It's when, when you look at all the pieces that are moving together, and you can mix and match those pieces together. That's when you discover all the possibilities that are. Okay. Cool. And then I, I had a quick question for you, and it's more to do with the fact that something you said right at the beginning about how um, they're very different but very similar types of technology, and how how would you see uh, any of these technologies working? Because on geospatial, generally, we're trying to look at a scientific output, and in video gaming, I guess we're trying to look at an artistic output. So. How do you see those two things rubbing up against each other? So one of the things that uh, this, this, I think, fits with uh, Tom's question. One of the things that you can do with WebGL2 is instead of having RGB as an output, you can have a buffer as an option, uh, as an output, I mean. Okay. So instead of having 8-bit RGBA on your screen and then that into a map tile and that into open layers or leaflet, you can have a buffer of 32-bit floating point data and dump that to a GTIF. You can do that. OK, cool. That's absolutely brilliant. I'm afraid we've run out of questions and run out of, uh, <laughs> run out of time as well. Nobody's going to so, tell me right. how to do something fancy with this? Oh, come on. I wanted to play with <laughs> I wanted to really play with Banji because it's, it's, it's fun and weird. Brilliant.